Hello and welcome to podcast number 28 from the Self-Publishing Formula. Two writers, one just starting out, the other a bestseller. Join James Blatch and Mark Dawson and their amazing guests as they discuss how you can make a living telling stories. There's never been a better time to be a writer. Mark, you've been a busy boy this week. You've just got off a webinar with uh, our friend Nick Stevenson. How did that go? It was great. Yeah, really good. Nick had a great webinar presentation planned and gave that. Loads of people turned up um, and almost all of them stayed till the end, which was great. And we, we spent about half an hour answering questions on, on book marketing. So that was fun. And, you know, as usual, I learned some stuff as well. So yep. all good, really. I think having you and Nick available together to answer questions covers a huge chunk of, uh, of what you need to know to get on with uh, self-publishing. So... Yeah, we covered we covered pretty much everything. So that was um, I, I hope people got good value out of it. I, I think they did. Good. And how was it? Quite advanced? No, not too much. Reasonably basic. Looking at how to you know find your first ten thousand readers. That's Nick's Nick's thing, of course. So yeah, at reasonably basic level, a good webinar for everyone. Good, because I mean, one of the things we're thinking a lot about is uh, is new authors, and I think a lot about it because I'm just getting towards the end of drafting my first novel, and I'm really starting to get into the next stage now. So we're we're building our 101 course, which we're, I know, very excited about. You, me and John all doing elements to it, mainly you, it has to be said, as the man who's cracked the whole model. But we should mention that we've opened up the list, the waiting list for 101, and also the waiting list for to become a beta tester. Not everybody on the list is going to get to be a beta tester. We'll make some selections at some point when the course is ready for testing, but that will be an opportunity to take the course for free and to feed back information to us. So if you're an author, you've got either your first draft and you're just moving into that next stage of marketing or you don't know where to start on it, or possibly you've got a couple of books but you haven't really got the commercial set up right yet, this is aimed at you. And you can get onto the list by going to selfpublishingformula.com in fact, it's on our homepage, a big banner at the top. And if you click on that, you'll get an email from us. You'll be there and you'll be invited into the Facebook group, etc., etc. It's a really big thing for us, isn't it? Because we think this is such an amazing industry at the moment. It's an amazing opportunity and an amazing time to be a writer. But you've got to get those steps right in the first instance to get yourself set up properly for success. Yeah, exactly. So I mean, the, the main course that we've done, I suppose I've become best known for is the Facebook ads course. And that's reasonably advanced, not not kind of completely advanced, but you do need to be a little bit down the road really before you start to implement that. But we've definitely come to the conclusion that there's a massive demand for something below that. So kind of a more of an entry level, almost nuts and bolts. So everything you need to do from the moment you finish your manuscript to the moment you're ready to start selling it and then beyond that with the second book and the third book and your optimum sequences, mailing lists, uh, social media, all of that kind of stuff that, to be honest, I kind of take that uh, for granted these days because I've been doing it for so long now. But when you actually step back and think about it and try and put yourself back into uh, your shoes uh, as you were five years ago, kind of where you are now, James, you realise quite quickly that there's a big demand for that kind of resource. So that's we are excited. Um, I've kind of cleared my calendar for September to start recording that. So we're hoping to get that at least in the can by the end of September. And then we'll start testing it in October and we're thinking about opening doors in November. Yep. So that URL again is www.selfpublishingformula.com. There's a big banner at the top of the page. You cannot miss it uh, when you're on there. Uh, one other thing I want to mention, uh, we're very excited. We have a fantastic interview, by the way, in just a moment. Uh, so we're going to uh, rattle through these parish notices as we say in in old England. Um, But the other thing I want to mention is coming up in September is Mark, I, and the uh, the third person who you don't hear from uh, in SPF, uh, John Dyer, all going to be in the United States. Um, Most of our students in the US, we have students around the world, should say, Australia, Europe, uh, here in Blighty. But the majority, the biggest percentage is the US, and we're going to drop in on a few of our students, the one, particularly the ones who started at the beginning with us and have had great success, meet them. And we're going to converge together at NINC, which of course is the annual conference down in Florida. And we are going to host a little get together. So just to have a, have a drink on us and come and say hello. And we would love to hear from you. If you listen to the podcast regularly, You're anywhere in the Florida area or within driving distance of Florida. And that's going to be on Wednesday, the 21st of September in the evening. So we'll put out some details on our Facebook page near the time when we sorted out an actual venue. It's probably going to be about seven o'clock in the evening and we'll go on till late. I don't think we're going to buy the drinks all night, Mark. I wish we should make that clear at this stage. 
<laughs> we get John to buy the drinks. <laughs> yeah, get, get us drunk, basically, and uh, <laughs> the drinks will be yours. But we would love you to come up and say hello to us. And uh, it's always absolutely brilliant. Is it? London Book Fair was the highlights for us this year, was meeting so many people who listen to the podcast or have been in our Facebook groups or even taken the course. But it would be lovely to see if you're going to Nink. So if you're in our Facebook group, you'll know, you should know about this already. But if you're not in our Facebook group, do drop us an email at support at selfpublishingformula.com and we will send you an invite to come to the Facebook group and that will give you the details of where we're going to meet. It's going to be very close to the main hotel, which is the, uh, what is it called again? It's on St. Pete's Beach, isn't it, in Florida? Trade Trade Winds. Trade Winds, well, the big resort hotel, Trade Winds. Yeah. And I'm not giving a venue detail yet because I'm speaking to the hotel and we're trying to work out what the best thing to do. It might be a, a nearby bar, it might be somewhere in the hotel. And we don't want to step on the toes of other things that are going on with Nink. I think there's a book bub reception mm. that night and absolutely you should be able to go to that and then come to us would be the plan but uh, anyway so that's a bit of SPF live in September in Florida so looking forward to uh, to seeing then if you can make that right time to get on with our interview so you'll know that earlier this year we spoke to the biggest selling KDP author on the planet and today we have the biggest selling KDP author in the United Kingdom Rachel Abbott, and uh, she has something very much uh, in common with Barbara Freethy in that she is very down to earth. There's no, once you start listening to her talking in a few minutes, there'll be no surprise as to why she's successful because very much like Barbara, she puts her head down, she understands how things work, and if they don't work, she keeps at it until they do work, and it's a methodical approach. Brilliant interview, very inspiring, very valuable. So without further ado, let's move on to, uh, to Rachel. And uh, we're going to pick up with, I asked Rachel at the beginning to talk to me about how she first got into writing. I didn't actually start writing until I had taken early retirement from work. And I published my first book in 2011, at the end of 2011. And through a lot of um, marketing effort and hard work, I managed to get it to the top of the charts. And since then, it's been all systems go, really. I've not stopped writing since. Uh, Rachel, I can't believe that you're retired already because we have we have met and you don't look old enough to have been retired from another career. But what was your other career? I used to run an interactive media company. Um, so I started that company in 1982 um, and we used to produce software and originally it was floppy disk software for schools mainly, mainly for the education market. Oh, uh, okay. So a little bit of crossover, I suppose you were quite ahead of its time, interactive media in the 1980s. And so you've, you've got one foot in the digital space coming up to this point of writing. But what motivated you to write? Was it the idea of self-publishing? Was it the idea simply of writing? You had no idea that you'd be self-publishing at that point? Um, it was really strange, actually, because I'd never thought about and I've, I've always been a voracious reader, um, but I've never really thought about writing a book until I was thinking in that sometime in the sort of late 90s, probably, I was talking to the chairman of my company and saying that I would, I'd quite like to sell the business um, because I'd been doing it for a long time and, you know, it was very exhausting. And I said, I'd quite like to sell it. And he said, well, what would you do? And I said, um, I think I'd probably write a book. And everybody looked at me and I kind of thought, yeah, I'd really like to do that. But then it was quite a long time after that before we actually did sell the business and even longer after that before I actually gave up work because I carried on working for the holding company for another five years after I'd sold business. And so I used to drive to work plotting murders, basically. <laughs> so you wanted to write. That was your motivation. You liked the idea of it and uh, you enjoy books. And then how did you make that transition? Because lots of people read books. Not everybody writes successful books. Well, I think it was because I had all this time driving to work and back because um, I used to drive for an hour each morning, even though it was only 15 miles. And I used to think about how the murder might actually take place because I wanted to work on the principle of what set of circumstances could be so bad that a woman would have no choice but to murder a man. And so once I'd got that idea into my head, I used to plot all this murder. Um, and then when I'd actually given up work, I found that I was bored. I was at a loose end. I didn't have enough to do. And at that point, it was one winter 
the weather was pretty vile. And I just went to the office and sat down and thought, I'm going to start writing that story and see what happens. And once I started writing, I found I couldn't actually stop. In the same way that you couldn't stop reading a, a good book, you couldn't stop writing a good book, which is always, That's right, yeah. always a good sign. And Rachel, when you, you think about the story and you think about the situation, and that's obviously quite a compelling beginning for your books, when you write them, are you... Because you can't just... We all know as writers, you can't just prosaically tell a story, right? Because that could take five minutes to tell somebody what happened. When you write a book, you really write about something else, don't you? You write about the effect on people's lives or the characters. So... I'm still intrigued as to how you made that transition. Having the idea of the story is one thing, isn't it? Turning it into a book that that has a greater impact on you is something else. How did you do that? Where did that come from? Well, you're right about that. That is quite difficult because sometimes when I start to write a book, I think, oh, this is going to be really short, you know, because you actually start to think, well, the story is very simple. But it's the relationships around the story that I find particularly intriguing. So most of my stories are slightly relationship-based. Some of them are very relationship-based. But it's the impact, not just on the the protagonist, it's the impact on the people around as well and the whole of the the family dynamic and, and what's going on with the rest of the family. So I try to get myself into the position where I'm thinking from the points of view of each of the individuals and telling their stories separately. Okay. And the relationship, of course, is what drives us as humans, really, isn't it? When when we go through our own lives, so that makes sense. So you got to the point of writing, and you found that came to you. And then when did you, what, did you approach publishers at that point? Did you start writing the the letters, or did you finish your book first? I finished the whole thing first, um, and then I wrote it again because you know it was a, it just wasn't right and I gave it a few people to read I gave it to my mother to read and she was always perfectly free with her opinions <laughs> as mothers <laughs> always are yeah sadly she's uh, she's no longer with us and she wasn't around when it was finally published so that was a shame but anyway she um she gave me her opinion as did several other people and I still wasn't going to do anything with it because I'd done it for my own enjoyment really and then my stepchildren came on holiday and um, they said, Can, could they read it? So I printed it out in chapter by chapter so that they could read a chapter and then pass it on to the next one. And it was really fascinating because they were so intrigued by the story. And we'd be having dinner in the evening and they'd say, oh, I really wonder what happened to this person. And I wonder why she did that. And I wonder who did this. And, and I thought, well, it's actually gripping them. So maybe there is something there. So at that point, I did send it out to a small number of agents and I got a reasonable response. But generally, they felt that it wasn't the kind of book that the market was looking for at that time. And I didn't want to faff around for years and years um, sending it and resending it to agents. So I didn't do anything. I put it on a, a virtual shelf for about a year and did nothing with it. Right. It's the old gatekeeper thing. Somebody else decides that people don't want to read your book. But we found a way of smashing through the gatekeeper, haven't we, with self-publishing. So when did that happen? It was probably September 2011. So so the book had been started sometime in 2009 and probably finished in 2010. And I had a look and saw, I'd, I'd had a look before to see about self-publishing. But initially, if you were in the UK, it was very difficult because to start off with, you needed a US bank account and a US tax code. And so I thought, oh, I can't be doing with all that. So again, I put it on the back burner. And then I noticed that you could actually start to self-publish for the Kindle if you were in the UK. So I thought, well, I'll just have a go at this then. That sounds all right. And it was actually more complicated in those days. But I, because of my background, I understood about HTML coding and so converting the book so that it was ready was relatively easy for me. That was a useful uh, little thing to have in your back pocket, a bit of HTML coding. You were uh, quite hands-on, obviously, in those days. And, I, you know, 2011 doesn't sound that long ago, but actually it was eons ago in self-publishing terms. You're probably almost alone as well. I doubt you had much contact with anybody else who was self-publishing, did you? Well, there was a little band of people, actually. So Mark Edwards and Louise Voss were had been self-publishing, although at that time they'd probably just got a publishing deal because their first, their book was so successful. And now they're kind of between, they're a bit hybrid now. But there was Mel Sherritt as well. And there were a few people around and we used to talk to each other and support each other. But it wasn't anywhere near as as difficult, I don't think. Technically, it was more difficult then. 
but in terms of the competition, it was it was less difficult than it is now. So did you start to see success straight away? No, um, and because I just stuck it up on Amazon and I thought, all right, there we go, then that's it. <laughs> and then <laughs> that was in November, so I published it on November the 15th. The Christmas we went to England, we were living in Italy at the time, so we came across to England and we were staying with one of the stepchildren again, and I suddenly I sold six on Christmas Day, and I was delirious. I thought this was fantastic, and, I th- and then I realised I was being a bit pathetic, really, because I used to run a company, and I'd done nothing to market this book at all. So after um, Christmas, I came back and I wrote a marketing plan. It took me two weeks to write the plan, and after that, it took four weeks to get to number one. Tell us, Rachel, what was in this plan? <laughs> <laughs> it was twenty-seven pages long, so I don't think it got long. I think what I was trying to do was I was trying to identify the ways in which people would become aware of my book. Building awareness is the most important thing to start off with when you start to uh, market your books. And I tried to look at ways of making people aware. And what I've been doing up to that point, I've been online and I've been thinking, oh, I'll do a bit of this and a bit of that and a bit of the other. There was nothing that was a, a concerted effort The things that I did then don't work so well now. I did a lot of uh, chatting to people on forums and they'd only just developed the Meet Our Authors forum and people were very supportive and and chatted a lot. Whereas now when you go to those forums, people just seem to cut and paste an advert for their book and then move on. But I built quite a lot of relationships that way. It was all about awareness. Every single aspect of the original marketing plan was making people aware. How could I get my book cover in front of as many eyes as possible? So you use forums and I guess some social media, organic social media as well at that point. Yeah, forums. Well, when I started, I had nine followers on Twitter. So that was impressive, wasn't it? (laughs) Um, So that was one of my things was building up my Twitter followers. And again, it was easier to do then because there were lots of things you could do with Twitter that you can't do anymore. Um, So one of the things I had a piece of software that allowed me to choose other authors. Obviously, you could do this in any industry, but I chose other authors who I thought were in a similar field to me. And I automatically, using this software, followed all of their followers. And then a lot of them had got auto-follow back switched on, so they all followed me back. So I was able to go from nine followers to 4,000 followers in about two weeks. So you did your you you put your twenty seven page marketing plan into action, and then you say within four weeks. So did that include any paid advertising? You used one or two tricks here and this bit of software for for Twitter, but was there paid advertising at that point? Nothing at all. It was all done. Uh, I worked fourteen hours a day, seven days a week for three months actually. So because I carried on after that, so January, February, March, I just never left my computer and ate vast quantities of chocolate biscuits. Mm. It's not good. <laughs> well, it's a vital ingredient. Coffee, yeah. co- coffee obviously, as well. Yeah. Coffee and chocolate biscuits, yeah. yeah. The, and then this, this fantastic moment that you, you saw yourself in the bestseller list. Uh, it, was, it was unbelievable. And a lot of that happened because of the forums. Suddenly it started to leap up the charts. And I posted on one of the forums, I don't know what's happening. And somebody said, check out this forum. And it was a reader's forum. But a few people had... Um, noticed my book and has started to read it and we're talking about it and so that really made a massive difference and when I went onto the forum there were hundreds of people actively talking about it and once you get a big leap in sales one day then you become much more much more visible and you're much more likely to be picked up by the Amazon algorithms so that your book gets promoted to people so it all kind of worked from there really yeah i mean it is and that's true today i think it's difficult to get a start but you'll you'll be surprised when you do get some momentum rolling things become a little bit easier because of those magical algorithms they reward success don't they so absolutely um i should say this is this is only the innocent i think the first book yes that's right yep so this was your first book and uh you've got at least five other books rachel i should Get it up on my browser now. I'm trying to think from memory. <laughs> I've got five full-length ones and one novella. Okay. So you had your success. You obviously got a bit of self-confidence about your writing at that point as well, because uh, we all lack that at first, don't we? But there was some some affirmation for you that people genuinely wanted to read what you were writing. Did you make money from the first book before you moved on to the second and third book? 
books. Oh, yeah. I originally priced the Owner of the Innocent at £1.99, which at the time was a pretty reasonable price because, of course, the vast majority of the, of the traditional publishers were selling ebooks at pretty much the same price as a paperback. So a one ninety nine price point at that point was was quite reasonable, and I sold a lot of books. I mean, when um, when it was at number one, it was selling between three and four thousand copies a day. So yes, so I was doing quite well out of it. Yes, you were making money from it. I can tell. <laughs> and you've moved on since then. And how how frequently have you written? I usually produce one book a year. Last year was a bit different because I'd written Strange Child in 2015, came out in February, and I was really pleased with the ending. I thought it was absolutely the right ending for the book. Uh, But there was a character in it who my readers obviously began to care about quite a lot, and they wanted to know what happened to her after the end of the story. And although I'm not a great fan of novellas myself, um, I don't often read novellas, I thought, well, you know, if if they really want to know, then I need to write what happened to her. And so I wrote the novella, and it's done incredibly well. Which which one's the novella? Nowhere Child. Oh, yes. Okay. It came after Stranger Child. Okay. Well, it's a good job you didn't kill this character who your your readers took to. (laughs) Absolutely. Well, I have actually thought every now and again about killing somebody off, but I've resisted. You'll get hate mail. Yeah. So, Rachel, I mean, it's quite inspiring to hear that you're, you know, from a standing start, but you've glossed, not glossed over, but you've spoken quite quickly about some of the detail, but the amount of work and study that went into this, and you're clearly having run your company into the detail, you understand that you've got to get the details right to make the whole thing work. So what sort of, before we move on to where you are today and how you operate your marketing in today's environment... For people starting out, what would your your general advice be? In terms of marketing, I tend to work on some basic principles. There is a basic principle in marketing that you have to get awareness, interest, desire and action all sorted out. So when you find, when you get people, as many people as you can, aware of your book and they reckon that you have to see the cover seven times before anybody would recognise it. What you want is you want people to see your book on Amazon and think, I think I've heard about that, I think I've seen that somewhere before. And then that sort of generates the interest. When they're interested, what are you going to do to create the desire in them to buy your book? And so you can do that by the way that you write your blurb. For example, that's really important that people get hooked when they read the blurb. Also, if you've got lots of good reviews from reputable reviewers, that helps enormously because they can see that other people have also enjoyed your book. So it's a whole process, really, from thinking the most you can do to make people aware. So I wrote to every blogger that I could find that did anything to do with thrillers or crime novels and said, can I write you an article? Can I do an interview? Will you review my book? And most of them wouldn't review it because it was my first book, but they would accept an an article or an interview. So people said to me, everywhere I go, I keep seeing your book cover. And so that was a really good thing. It was raising the awareness. So that's the sort of the main principle. The action one isn't quite so applicable because um, in terms of marketing terms, that means make it easy to buy. But if they're already already on Amazon, it's pretty easy to buy anyway. But sometimes people even now send me an email and they say, you can find my book on Amazon. And I think, where's the link? Mm. People aren't going to just think, oh, I'll go and look that up. Some might. Most just want to be able to click on something, and there it is. So those are the kind of basic principles. And the other thing that is of critical importance, and you know all about this, but is maintaining a really good database of your readers. So having a mailing list and using it sensibly. Okay, well, let's move on to the main list in just a moment. Just to sum up that bit, I think in terms of attitude, I think you've worked really hard, but in a very focused way. Obviously, when you, you got those refusals from people, you must have a few of those in a row. There were no points at which you threw your hands up in the air and, and walked away or gave up. You just took an, an almost, uh, we often say to people, you've got to be unemotional about the marketing side of things. You've got to treat it like your day job, a business. And that seems to me how you, you know, one of the secrets to your success is that sort of plodding through, if you like, meticulously through it. Yes, I think that's that's a very good description. Sometimes in the early days, it did feel like plodding through it. You know, oh, I've got to do this. And there weren't so many things to automate things either. So 
It was mm-hmm. much more hands-on. You had to be constantly thinking of new, interesting things to say to people. Okay, let's talk about the mailing list. So at what point did you start gathering the email addresses of your readers? Not soon enough. Mm, everyone uh, says that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, probably by book three. I don't think I did it. on. I, so at the moment, in, in all my books now at the end, there is a, if you want to find out more about Rachel Abbott's books, please click here. And it takes you to um, the website. So I get quite a lot of people who actually sign up every day, people who've read the book and think, oh, yeah, I want to be notified when there are more books. And now, of course, on Amazon, there is a follow button as well. So if you look under an author's description, there's a yellow follow button. And if you click that, you will also be notified when that author writes a new book by Amazon. So there's lots of different ways now, but building my mailing list was something that I cannot believe that I didn't think of it. It's really, really bad. But I didn't actually think about it until the third book was coming out. But you have started building it since then. And how important is it to you today? It's very important. I mean, for me, the important thing is keeping in touch with my readers. So that's something else I've not done as well as I should have done, because now my marketing plans have got two strands. One is keeping the existing readers happy. And the other one is finding new readers because my existing readers are such a great bunch. They are so supportive. You know, you just have to go onto Facebook and post something and get loads of responses and loads of positive feedback. And so it's really important that I do things with my mailing list, with my newsletters that that is going to appeal to them and not just all about trying to get new readers. So so when I do my marketing plan, I think very much about existing readers and they're the ones who I approach through my mailing list and through Facebook. And, and Rachel, you sell a lot of books that potentially are the biggest selling UK KDP author. I don't know, is that can do you know that for sure? You confirm uh, last April they confirmed that over the previous five years that I was the highest selling author on Amazon UK. Yeah, which is amazing. Congratulations on that. And and, and, and <laughs> as we're hearing in this interview, not an accident, you know, something that you've worked at and, and got to this point. So what I'm getting at, I suppose, is your you sell books well beyond your list and your profit points are, are well beyond your list. But the list is an important, particularly for a new book being launched. And that's one of the reasons why you're so careful about your existing readers. They are there to get your book that initial push. Yes, it is really important that. And so I do a lot of things around the launch. I have a a, a fairly large launch plan, which is in a spreadsheet and there's so much stuff that goes on. So um, as well as using the mailing list to notify all my existing readers, which is great. I also obviously use Facebook and Twitter for that. But I do quite a lot of stuff leading up to it, you know, little teasers and things. And uh, here's the cover, here's a bit of the blurb, here's a bit of the story. And just to try and get people interested so that when the book actually is available to buy, people have already shown some commitment to buying it. And a lot of people say, I don't understand why you do this. But every year when I do a launch, I do a Facebook party. And that's really for the people who have consistently followed me throughout the year and it's full of daft quizzes and prizes and competitions and uh, and I get really good feedback from that and it's again it's a relatively small number in relation to the size of the database and and the number of followers but it's the people who have been most consistently on my side and have been supportive who who come along and I chat to them all day which is great. That sounds like quite a lot of work Rachel have you got a team now? Yes, I'm afraid I couldn't do it all myself. Now it would, I would just would not be able to cope with that. So I have a, a PA who works with me here in my office. She just comes in a couple of mornings a week, but she also works from home for an hour or so each day, just doing some of the background stuff that he's doing. I also have a virtual assistant who um, actually is the same. So Joanna Penn put me in touch with her, so we both use her, and uh, and she's in Canada. And she does quite a lot of the work on the database and builds the newsletters and all kinds of other things along those lines. My PA here has to organise all my travel because I'm very rarely in one place for more than two or three weeks before I have to go somewhere. And um, I've now got a publicist and I've always I've had an agent since I first produced Only the Innocent. So a publicist, that's quite interesting. How long have you had a publicist? And what? Because we we did an episode on that and Mark's, Take, uh, recently invested in a publicity company 
uh, he, in fact, uh, for, for our company as well, for SPF, and we've we've been quite pleased with the results and see them as quite important to get to the next level. Not not necessarily important at the first stage, but if you want to ramp things up, we found that's been very useful. Have you found the same thing? Definitely. Uh, I think it's it's very difficult. I've had a few conversations about this at um, various talks that I've given, um, and the same with an agent, but we'll talk about that separately. But in terms of the publicist, the thing is, it's very difficult to quantify what they do for you because this my publicist now has got me some fantastic reviews in magazines, you know, magazines like Good Housekeeping magazine and Red magazine. And, and the thing is, if you actually look on the publication day of the magazine, the sales probably don't go up. So people say, well, how's that work then? But what it's, again, it's all about awareness. It's making more and more people aware of who, of, of who Rachel Abbott is. And so it's that she organises me to speak at festivals. And again, people say, well, going to festivals doesn't you know, sell you any books. But it's all about being out there and being seen and being taken seriously. Yeah, so similar, I suppose, to raising awareness that you did in the first stage, but on a smaller scale in the forums where there were readers, some readers active in online forums, was now you're popping up around the world in different places. And the magazines that you mentioned, certainly in the UK, Red Magazine, I notice it appearing in our house. Uh, so that's quite a well-read magazine. And I always say to people, and I used to work in PR before, it is a drip, drip, drip thing. You can't ever look at a single PR event and think that's going to do things for you. What's going to do things for you is 24 months worth of popping up all over the place. And as you say, people then connecting the dots and leading them at some point to click buy and try one of your books. That's absolutely right. And the thing is that the people who you get through forums and Facebook and Twitter, they're only a very, relatively small fraction of the people who read books. You know, if I think about my friends who are really, they love reading, most of them don't have a Twitter account at all. And the vast majority of them don't have. Most of them do have a Facebook account, but a lot of them, a lot of them don't use it very often. So you know, you, you, you have to make people aware by as many means as you can. And for some people, that might mean, you know, if you get a publicist who can get you an article in the Sunday Times, as my previous publicist did, you know, it, it makes a big difference. People know who you are. They've heard of you. OK, and let's just talk about the role of an agent, Rachel. Then I want to talk to you a bit about productivity and your approach to writing. But um, so so for those of us at the beginning of our writing careers who don't really know what what an agent does when you're self-publishing. Can you explain that? Yes. A lot of people have said to me, well, what on earth do you need an agent for? Because the agent's job is to sell your books to a traditional publisher. And so they don't understand why I've got one if I'm going to remain independently published. The fact is that um, my agent, and not all agents are created equal, it has to be said, but my agent gives a massive amount of editorial input. So when I come up with an idea for a book my agent asks me to send a synopsis of the book book that I want to write. And she comes back with suggestions. Are you sure you've got this right, et cetera, et cetera. And then I write maybe the first 20,000 words and she has a look at that and she gives me some feedback on that. And so it goes on. So she's actively involved in the process of making sure that I am writing for my audience. So she's got a very clear idea in her head because as a writer, it's, you know, it's quite easy to go off on a bit of a tangent and you need somebody to be able to pull you back to, to where you want to be. So, so she does all of that, but she also is constantly thinking about my future. Do I want to remain independent? Do I want to do a hybrid deal? How do I want to work? What about other countries? So my books are now translated into over 20 languages, and that's all through the agent. That's really interesting, the uh, editorial role almost like the role of a structural editor who would give you some consultation advice I wonder how many writers particularly self-published writers have that type of relationship with an agent I think it depends on the agent so certainly my agent is Lizzie Kramer and um, she works for David Hyam Associates and I'm fairly certain that all of the agents there give editorial feedback because I do know people who work with other agents within that company and they all get editorial feedback and it, it's key. But one of my one of my writing friends is now with um, David Hyam Associates, was previously with another, um, which I, obviously I won't mention, and never got any editorial feedback at all. Hmm. Never. And so I think having the right agent is really important. Having an agent who just 
send your book out to publishers, which is fine if you want to be traditionally published, that would work great. But, you know, unless they're actually actively selling your translation rights as well, in some cases, I think people don't need an agent. But for me, because she's actually helped so much in the whole development of my career and encourage me when I'm feeling really, you know, oh, it's not going very well. You know what it's like. It's sometimes the story doesn't come together. She helps and she puts forward ideas and it works really well. Great. So, Rachel, when do you get a chance to write? Because you seem quite busy. <laughs> I am busy. Um, so I do tend to work seven days a week, um, but I that doesn't mean to say I don't take any time off. So, for example, this afternoon, after we finish talking, I'm going out for the rest of the afternoon. Um, you're going to go mostly, sw- you're swimming? No, I'm not going swimming, <laughs> no. I was going to go swimming, but, but some friends are having a barbecue, so okay. I'm going to go to that instead. Um, so I do tend to try and work at least a fair part of every day. And most days, I'm in the office for about seven or eight hours. Um, the days that my PA is in... I do admin when she's here because I can't really write very well because obviously we've got a lot of things to to discuss and I would lose my concentration. But I do set myself um, a word count once I start writing because I have deadlines in my head by when I need to finish things and I work very hard to stick to that word count. Can you give us an idea of what that is? (laughs) It depends on the stage of the book. At the moment, it's about 2,000 words a day. Okay. But sometimes it's more, sometimes it's a lot more. Because after I published a book, so my last book came out in February, March and April were pretty much spent doing the marketing, tying up the loose ends, all the other stuff that needed to be done, and putting forward some ideas for the next book. And then I started writing in May, but I started a completely different book and then went changed tack halfway through and went back to a different story. So I lost a month or so there. And so it goes on like that, you know, those sorts of things happen all the time. I will go back to the original idea in the future. But so there's been a bit of um, a bit of dodging around from one idea to another at the moment. So that's why I'm going to be on a fairly tight schedule and I might have to up the ante to 3,000 words a day. And these are deadlines you set yourself effectively. I suppose your agent is, is probably in your in your ear a little bit encouraging you. Uh, she never pushes me at all. The, the problem I have is obviously that when I've written something and it goes to her, she's got so many other people she's got to look out for that I have to obviously make sure that it fits in with her timing as well. So there's no point me sending her something when she's about to go off on holiday, for example. So I try and work around that as well, but she tries very hard to accommodate me. And it takes quite a bit of backwards and forwards and and you know quite a lot of... Ideas, like you said, the structural edit has to be done and then there's the the line edit and the copy edit and the proofreading and it all takes time. And when you start your book, how developed is the structure? When I actually start writing, the structure is quite well thought through. When I come up with the idea, first of all, I just do a kind of one-page synopsis, but then I work really hard on the characters and I have very comprehensive character descriptions and location descriptions and also I have a, a, a plan of the time, so I know what time of year it is. So I know if somebody's going out at six in the morning, is it going to be light or is it going to be dark? And what sort of weather they might be getting? You know, if you're writing thrillers, there is a temptation for every single scene to take place on a dark winter's night yeah. when it's raining and snowing. But that's a bit, you know, I guess a bit tedious, doesn't it? Um, And so you have to think through all of those things. So I do a lot of work in advance on that. um, And I have a pretty comprehensive structure for the story, although it does tend to divert from that structure as the story goes. But I don't like writing into a vacuum. I like to think I know where it's going, even if it does actually go a bit off piste along the way. And what tools do you use? Are you Microsoft Word or Scrivener or one of the others? I use Scrivener a lot, actually. Um, there's a lot of things I really like about Scrivener. So, for example, if I'm using Scrivener um, to write, which, as I, as I say, my first draft is always in Scrivener, but then once it goes off to be edited, it goes into Word and because nobody else edits. Well, the editors don't work in Scrivener. So um, if I use Scrivener, I can easily find the chapter that I want to go to because down the left-hand side of the screen, you've got the folders with all of the chapters and then the text sections with all the scene names. So it's really quick and easy to find um, the bit that you're going to. But it's not just that. I can also use keywords so that if I'm... Tracing, if I'm following, for example, a 
one element of the story, let's say somebody's mobile phone goes missing, I can actually tag every chapter where the mobile phone is mentioned with a keyword, and then I can just read those chapters to make sure that story actually is consistent and nothing gets lost along the way. So I use Scrivener a lot, and I also use Scapple, which is by the same people as Scrivener, and that's a kind of mind mapping tool. And I use that a lot to work out what I think might happen in various scenes. Yeah, the, the keyword functionality is something I'm aware of, but n- not used. I think Mark uses it, but that, uh, that's something I I definitely need to get into. As you say, you, you write something, then you realise you need to check it for consistency from something five chapters previously, and it can be a bit, yeah. of, a, bit of a pain having to wade through working out where that stuff is. The keywords seems to be like a, a good way around that. Well, you can create collections, and that works really well. So... Uh, most of my stories have got lots of different strands. So um, there's always a policeman in my stories called Tom Douglas. Mm. And he is not the main character, believe it or not. Um, he's always there because there's always a crime to be solved. But the main characters, in my head at least, are the people who are either the perpetrators or the victims of the crime. And it's their story that I'm telling. And then Tom Douglas comes in and does his bit. But there are normally, and the one I'm working on at the moment, there are sort of four stories that are running side by side. And of course, they will all converge at some point. But it's really important that I can check all of those stories individually. So any scene that relates to any one of those stories, I can actually just read all of those scenes sequentially by using collections. Um, And that really helps me to make sure that I haven't done anything ridiculous, like somebody's already dead and I've got them in a conversation or something, (laughs) which which I don't think I've ever done, actually. But you know what I mean? We'd all think think that's clever and deliberate and uh, (laughs) you're playing playing with us if that happens. So, Rachel, Kill Me Again, I think was your lovely, fantastic title, by the way, Kill Me Again. Um, That was, I think, probably your latest? Yes. Uh, And you've got your next one in the pipeline? Yes, I have. Okay, just so because I think people, uh, those who haven't come across uh, Rachel Abbott's work yet will want to investigate it. I'm sure having heard it, you talk about it in detail. One final area then, Rachel, before we let you go for your barbecue is Facebook advertising. I know something that you've been increasingly interested in and you, it's how we, we got talking earlier this year. Is that something yeah. that's, that's a, a feature for you now? Yes, Um I don't do as much of it as I would like to, actually, and that is down to time. I am trying to get other people in my team involved in doing it because I do think it works well. I use the Boost Post facility quite a lot so that I can actually boost a post to certain sectors. But I have started to to follow the course, Mark's course, and and I think it works really well, and there's so many brilliant tips in that, actually. But it is one of those things that I would do a lot more of, but I just need to find the time. And that is the to get other people up to speed so that other people could do it on my behalf, really. Yeah, it is. Uh, there, there's some detail there to master, isn't there? So, Well, Rachel, it's uh, been a real pleasure talking to you. It was great fun to meet you in London uh, earlier this year. And uh, it's, it's fun to think back to you and Mel Sherat earlier in, in 2011 around then and sort of pioneers, really, uh, who led the way. And here you are now with a fantastic catalogue. Uh, and as you say, as has confirmed the UK's best-selling KDP author, which is an inspiration to all of us. Thank you very much, James. That's very kind of you. God, I love talking to Rachel. She was over there in Jersey. I think it was Jersey or Alderney, one of the Alderney. Cha- Alderney, that's it. One of the Channel Islands, which is a, a group of islands in between Britain and France. A very, very lovely, very beautiful. And uh, she works away in her office, and she talked to us a bit about there, obviously about um, uh, how she does her writing alone, and then does a bit of admin with her PA. And she has a nice life. She does a lot of travelling as well, I should say, Rachel. But uh, I absolutely love talking to her. I love listening to the fact that she gets on with business. You know, this is not, again, we, we come back to this theme, Mark, don't we? People, you don't sit around wait, waiting for magic things to happen. You make them happen, right? Yeah, I tried the uh, first approach to my first couple of books, and surprisingly enough, that didn't work for me very well. It was only when I um, realised that you need to be more than just a writer these days, if if you're going to make it, that that things started to pick up steam. And 
yeah, you're right. Rachel is um, is a very, very good example of someone who takes her career by the scruff of the neck and just shakes it and shakes it until until things start to go right for her. Um, so yeah, completely inspirational. And for you too, James, when you're getting to the stage now where we, you know, we're going to be finishing your book, or you're going to be finishing your <laughs> book soon, and then um, otherwise I'll be publicly shaming you and, and we're yeah. going to get that book uploaded and, and start selling it. That's the plan. Yeah, well, I'm properly into uh, the finishing stages now. I'm at that point where I'm obsessing about it all the time. So I went out and cut the um, the cricket strip at our ground for an hour this afternoon. So one of the things I do a couple of times a week, just find it quite therapeutic and just thinking over and over again about the wording and how the, the whole book's uh, going to finish and so on. But I guess you have that all the time. You professional writers, you. Actually, that reminds me, that still smarts, doesn't it, the person who decided you weren't a real writer because you did your own marketing. <laughs> you still You still mention that in your emails. I do still mention it because it's um it's the most ridiculous comment I've ever heard. The, the fact that I do, I do I told her I do fifty percent marketing, fifty percent writing, and she thought that that meant I wasn't a, a full time writer. So uh, I don't know where her books are, though, James. Yeah, it's, fun, it's funny that where are those books? And then Rachel Abbott's not a proper writer because she does her own marketing. It's exactly, ludicrous. Okay, look, thank you very much indeed for listening. Just to remind you, if you want to get on the waiting list, and an opportunity possibly to be a beta tester and get the 101 course from SPF for free. Go to selfpublishingformula.com and click on the banner at the top of the page and sign up there. And if you're going to be in the United States, in the southern part of the United States, in Florida, next month, September, on Wednesday, the 21st of September, in the evening, we're going to be in the Tampa area, St. Pete's Beach. Details to come later on. We look forward to seeing you if you can make it to then. Uh, you're going on holiday for a week, but we will be back uh, next week with another exciting episode. Have a nice break, Mark. I will do, and I'll speak to you next time. You've been listening to the Self-Publishing Formula podcast. Visit us at selfpublishingformula.com for more information, show notes, and links on today's topics. You can also sign up for our free video series on using Facebook ads to grow your mailing list. If you've enjoyed the show, please consider leaving us a review on iTunes. We'll see you next time.